All right, we'll go ahead and get going. Um, we're at the final Centering Servingness webinar of the year. Monique and I were sharing yesterday that we're always so sad when they come to a close because they're the highlight of what we get to do monthly. Um, I'm so grateful for the incredible year of speakers, um, the commitment to and passion for this work and all that we have learned along the way. Um, and like I said, super sad that we are coming to a close already after another very busy year. Uh, today's webinar will be equally as powerful, I'm sure of it. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a special welcome from Faculty Affairs and HSI Initiatives. I'm Judy Marcus Kiyama um, here at the University of Arizona, and I serve as the Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development. I usually give a a little shout out at the end of the webinar, but I want to make sure to do so early this time um, and make sure everybody knows how much we appreciate Monique Beltran, um, who helps to organize the webinar from behind the scenes and is essential truly to everything that we do within faculty affairs and HSI initiatives. So thank you, Monique. Um, know that we appreciate you so much. Um, I want to start uh, by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnership, and community service. Last year, we partnered with Research, Research Innovation and Impact, RII, to launch these HSI seed grants. Um, and in direct alignment with this concept of serviness that we've talked about all year, the goal of the program is to support scholarly research and creative work among faculty, which enriches the University of Arizona's designation as an HSI um, and advances scholarship that directly impacts queer, trans, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, and communities, um, and fulfills the U of A's purpose and values. So these seed grants aim to support early career scholars, mentoring relationships and research teams, and aim to advance racial equity across research. And we're very grateful to RAI for collaborating us, um, with us on this program. We were able to support seven projects um, over this year, and I'll put the, the link in the chat that describes each of the projects. Um, and the proposals actually for this year's call close tomorrow. Um, what I appreciate about all seven projects and in particular, the two that you'll hear about today is that they truly embody the goals of this webinar series, um, which is of course to spotlight current scholarship, offering examples of the rich ways in which serviness is enacted by faculty and staff across the institution, to learn together about engaging in these efforts um, and to build knowledge together and address the question what next steps are needed to build institutional capacity around HSI servingness. Um, our speakers today are representing their entire collaborative research teams and they'll share a little bit more about those teams and, and research partners um, when they each present. So our first uh, presenter is Professor Shafali Milcherik Desai. Um, she's an Associate Clinical Professor of Law, Director of the Workers' Rights Clinic, Co-Chair of the Bacon Immigration Law and Policy Program within the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers College of Law. She's a recipient of the College of Law's Distinguished Public Service Scholar Award and a Sustainable Economies Law Center Fellow. She instructs the next generation of attorneys in client-centered and cross-cultural lawyering um, through representation of low-wage immigrant and migrant workers throughout Arizona's borderlands. Professor Desai writes at the intersection of employment, labor law, Im immigration law, critical legal theories, and uh, movement law theory. Dr. Amanda Cheremaya is from the village of Caguate, located on the homelands of Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico. She is the director of Native SOAR, which stands for Student Outreach, Access, and Resiliency. Native SOAR is an Indigenous-focused multi-generational mentorship program. She has served in various capacities within the program for over 10 years. And she believes that one of the greatest gifts that she has as an educator, a mentor, and a sister is the ability to build the confidence of students, especially Indigenous youth through storytelling, photography, and videography. Amanda cares deeply about giving back to her Indigenous community and transforming spaces through visual narratives, Indigenous-focused scholarship, and methodologies. 
Usually we will hold questions until the end, but today we'll have Professor Desai share first, and then we'll facilitate questions related to her team's project. And then Dr. Chomaya will share and we'll facilitate a series of questions again. So please help me welcome our incredible guests. I'm so excited that you get to hear about their projects. Um, Shefali, we'll have you kick off. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I, I wanna give a special shout out to Dr. Judy Marquez Kiyama for facilitating this faculty seed grant. And of course, the Hispanic Serving Institute faculty seed research grants without whom this work would not be possible. So thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen here with my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, all right, here we go, um, and, and get going. So you already know who I am. I'm not gonna introduce myself, but I do wanna just briefly introduce my co-PI, Professor Tara Sklar, who's our health lab professor over at the College of Law. Um, and I'll explain in just a moment how it is that the two of us came together to work on this project. So we have a growing body of work, which we've put into Star Wars themes since we both have young boys. Uh, we have prequels that we both worked on separately. Uh, Professor Sklar working mainly on Medicare, Medicaid waivers for aging in place and looking at the shortfalls of long-term care facilities. And uh, meanwhile, I was taking a look at immigrant women mostly who work as aides in nursing homes who we've been seeing as clients of our clinic. And by the way, my JD and undergraduate law students represent these folks when they come to our clinic with uh, employment and labor violations that they have experienced. So when we started talking to one another, we realized that we had two pieces of the same puzzle. Um, and that's what led to a work that we published last fall called The Return of Typhoid Mary, Immigrant Workers in Nursing Homes. And in that paper, which was a theoretical paper, we talked about the parallels between the typhoid epidemic in the early 1900s, which was very much fueled by young immigrant women, low wage workers who would show up to work ill and then spread a deadly virus, which is exactly what we started seeing with COVID with, this, with a similar worker population. And, and then at the end of that project, we realized that what was really missing in the literature was the voices of the actual women who are the workers who are experiencing these employment and labor law violations and also part of this uh, nexus of spreading, of spreading COVID. And that's what led us to this project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I do want to say that we have a part three plan, so stay tuned, and I'd love any uh, suggestions you might have in the Q&A, because what we'd like to do is actually test the hypotheses that come out of this current project and actually engage in some real-world interventions to see if we can make a difference. So why are we doing this work right now? Well, as I talked about earlier, COVID very much crystallized this problem that we were seeing in long-term care facilities throughout the nation. To date, about a third of all COVID deaths have happened in nursing homes. And there was a very interesting study that happened in the summer of 2022 that talked about how uh, nursing home aides spread COVID by they looked at their cell phone data and they and about 40% of the spread of COVID in nursing homes was attributed to nurse to aides showing up ill and, and about a, a third of aides are also immigrants. Um, and, and they show up to work ill, which we call presenteeism because they have no choice economically, they need to go to work and they're not being provided with paid sick leave. And then they, they spread COVID, which as we know is fatal to the most vulnerable population which exists in nursing homes. And then, of course, now we're seeing the great American labor shortage, and that's very much happening in nursing homes and long-term care, as well as the rest of the healthcare industry. And we have this set of immigrant workers who very much want to do this work, but often cannot find legal ways of being here to engage in this work. And so this is what led us to really want to look at this issue, especially because the proposed legislative and business solutions to date have not been focused on workers. They, they've been mostly focused on regulations in long-term care, but not looking at the worker side. And we decided that we re that, that needs to be addressed if we're going to address the, the holistic picture. And we decided to look at these issues through some theoretical frameworks because employment and labor rights, for the most part, exist for all workers, whether they have immigration status or not. And there are important policy reasons for that, right? You don't want to create a second-class workforce that lives in the shadows. You also don't want to create an incentive for employers to not hire documented and citizens. Um, but despite these protections, what we are finding time and again, especially in our clinic, is that immigrant women working in nursing homes 
are not being able, they're not able to access these rights. And so that led us to look at this through some theoretical frameworks, critical legal theories, feminist jurisprudence, movement law, which is this emergent uh, idea that talks about working policymakers and lawmakers working alongside movements so that you actually have those voices at the table about what kinds of laws will be most helpful to them. And then also public health law solidarity theory that also very much comes out of the COVID era. This idea that we have to look at these problems through a paradigm of mutuality, because if we're not supporting workers and ensuring their rights are being upheld, we're, we're also hurting uh, everybody else, including our parents who we might want to have in long-term care facilities, and, and eventually many of us will also be in that same position. And so these theoretical framings help reveal the gaps that the law currently has for these workers. and most specifically that the law doesn't take into account their lived reality. So what is their lived reality? Well, the workers that we were seeing in the clinic, they have been in long-term care for many, many years. They work 12 hour plus days, often seven days a week, and they're engaged in all of the activities of daily living required for residents. They're medicating residents, they're dressing them, they're bathing them, they're feeding them. In many instances, they're also preparing the food, they're cleaning the facilities. Some, some even engage in grocery shopping and gardening for the facilities. And they do all of this with no to limited training. They're often not being paid minimum wage, not being paid overtime, no hazard pay, and not receiving PPE. And so you set that up against the backdrop of a vulnerable workforce that either doesn't know their legal rights or can't access them, doesn't engage in complaint making because they're really afraid of what we call retaliation. And that is the employer terminating somebody for raising their rights, which again, these women can't afford to not to lose their jobs. And also there are explicit threats that many employers make of immigration retaliation because many of these workers lack documentation. We also have the overarching issue of not having a paid sick leave law in this country. We're one of the very few Western countries that doesn't. And, and so we have this patchwork of state and local laws, but that makes it harder for people to keep track of what rights they have depending on where they're at. And then there's also this issue of under-resourced and under enforcement by labor, state and labor agencies. They're typically waiting for the workers to make complaints in order to go investigate. But as I already mentioned, this worker population is often not going to be engaged in complaint making. So we knew kind of knew all of this based on the workers coming to the clinic and also these theoretical framings, but we didn't know it from the workers themselves. So that's why we decided to actually go and talk with them. And thanks to the U, U of A's Hispanic Survey Institute grant, we were able to, to engage in this qualitative study. So what we did is we elicited the narratives of six immigrant women who work as long-term care aides, and we asked them to shed light on, we wanted their perceptions. So we wanted them to talk in a very open-ended way about whether or not workers' rights have been helpful to them, and if not, why? And what changes would they, would they, would they like to see that they think would be helpful? And it was so interesting as we did these interviews, when we first asked that question, many of the women were kind of taken aback that we were actually asking them for their thoughts, their input. Uh, but once they understood that, yes, we really did want to hear from them, it, it, was, it was like it opened up a geyser and they had a lot to tell us. Um, and, and we, you know, it is really important here that we bring their voices to the table because they're not stakeholders who are typically involved in, in lawmaking and policymaking. So what was the methodology that we used? Well, we had criteria that they had to, to fulfill. And I use this term immigrant here to capture really the entire workforce we're looking at. And it's a low wage, mostly Latinx workforce that's been referred to as a brown collar workforce. But importantly, some people have documentation, some people don't. There are various levels of immigration, which is why I use uh, immigration status, which is why I use that term. And we conducted these interviews between October and March um, of this academic year. The study participants were screened, of course, and we followed all of the protocols, uh, the human subjects protocols that we had submitted. And we, we uh, had initially hoped to do 60 minute interviews, but we realized pretty quickly that we needed 90 minutes because we didn't wanna have to call these women back. All, all of these women, um, you know, they, they work long hours, they lack childcare, the, some, some of them had difficulty finding transportation to come to the clinic. And so we wanted to make sure that it was inclus as inclusive as possible. So we ended up doing 90 minute interviews. And it really importantly here, we decided to involve our students. So we involved the JD law students 
were involved in creating the questions and also asking the questions during the interviews, but we also involved our undergraduate law students because many of those students come from the same immigrant communities that we're seeing the, the clients of the clinic come from, and they also serve as cultural bridges. So they provided the interpretation and some of the translation for the study, uh, which was really wonderful. Uh, and we also had a media audio specialist. Um, she's also a documentary filmmaker who's made docu we've partnered to make documentary films in the past. So she was recording all of these interviews. We provided uh, $49 gift cards to each of the participants. I wish we could have provided more, but there were some regulations that prevented us from doing that. Um, we also, uh, what we use is that there are these 32 criteria, it's called the Consolidated Criteria for Reporting Qualitative Research, and we use those criteria in creating our questions. And specifically, we wanted to ensure open-ended questions that would provide for as much um, kind of storytelling as possible by our interviewees. And we ask them questions in three content areas, which I'll talk about more specifically in a minute. But importantly, and, and I would stress the importance of this, we piloted the question. So in other words, we did mock, we did like a mock interview, actually two or three rounds of that with our entire research group. And I'm so glad that we did that because we went from having like five pages of questions, we were able to narrow it down to three and put questions in an order that really made a lot of sense. So we asked them for their experience as aides, and, and this and this included socio-demographic information, but again, this was this very open-ended question. We wanted them to tell us about their experiences. Then, then we asked them about awareness and understanding of their legal rights, and one of the interesting things here is that people who are former clients of the clinic were framing this in a, in a way that was different than we had a couple of nursing home aides who had never been clinics of the uh, clients of the clinic. So that, that was really interesting from a clinical, uh, you know, instructor point of view. And then we asked them about whether or not they're able to access their workers' rights and situations in which they might have wanted to do that but were unable to. Here are some sample questions and probes that we asked, which I'm not going to read through in the interest of time. Um, and then we have taken all of this information and we're in the process of transcribing, translating the, tran you know, creating the transcripts and then reviewing them um, so that we can create the frameworks and the themes necessary for the written, pro written paper that will come out of it. Um, we had 12 individuals we screened. We ended up with six. Uh, there was a big age range, big range of time they worked as aides, big educational range. We actually had one interviewee who was a lawyer in Mexico before she came here to do this work. And again, their immigration statuses really varied. Um, what we what we found is, as uh, kind of patterns was that there are routine and persistent employer violations of, of workers' rights. And also everybody asked for education and not just for education for themselves, but also for their employers. And interestingly, they thought it would be better if it was done together with the employers. And then the, the final piece, which is very heartbreaking, is that there's this poor quality of care that, that we heard in all of the stories. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the, the women themselves were not provided with training and weren't provided with the rest and time off or the staff to patient ratios, which would have which would have allowed for better patient care. Uh, there's some quotes here that again I'm going to just breeze through in the interest of time, but I wanted to mention this one because it was just it just hit all of us really hard. Uh, this interviewee said, "My family told me to quit to have some dignity, but I said." I can't feed people with dignity. And and I, I just want to mention that we were all in tears for much of these interviews. I mean, the, the women we were interviewing were in tears, students were in tears, I was in tears, and, and, and I did talk to the students about decompressing afterwards because there's secondhand trauma. You know, the women are talking about trauma they've endured, and then everyone else in the room, in, you know, has second secondhand trauma from that, and that's important to address. Um, but I also want to say that, and I tell my students this in the clinical setting too, that, that we are doing a service just by having these women come, tell their stories, have their voices heard, and then for someone to say, yeah, you know what, that, that's really important and we're, gonna, we're going to try to find a way to incorporate that into solutions. So I'm going to breeze through the other quotes here, but they address all of the areas. Um, and then finally, our discussion pieces, of course, are that how can we address this issue of lack of awareness around rights or lack of ability to access rights? And also to make sure people understand that if we can address these issues, we're going to address a big hole that we have in our long-term care uh, facilities currently and, and address the labor shortages. And, and of course, we need more education, more regulatory oversight, and more enforcement, which are currently very minimal in this area. 
we believe that our study had lots of strengths and some limitations. On the limitation side of things, we had a small sample. We weren't able to, in this round, include employers or regulators, but we'd very much like to do that in phase three. Uh, we had many strengths. I mean, we reached this very hard to reach population in large part due to the work that our clinic does. Uh, we involved students. And, and as, as I said before, we provided an opportunity for these women to have their stories heard and come to the table. Uh, we have very preliminary recommendations and conclusions. Of course, we need a nationalized paid sick leave law that would help. But a big caveat is we need a law that will address this worker population, which is why bringing their voices to the table is so important. Because if we just use the models that we currently have, it's, it's, it's still going to fail these particular workers. We also need to have more robust anti-retaliation protections and more enforcement by state and federal labor agencies, and then more education and outreach, both with the worker populations and also with employers. And so I want to end there and make sure there's enough time for questions. But if you please feel free to reach out to us. There's our contact information on the screen for me, for Tara. You can find us on the University, the College of Law's website also. And I'll stop the share and, and take. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shafali. I think that there's so much more to have in this um, conversation. I'm sure you... Um, could have presented for a couple of hours. I know that you all just came back from a conference as well. You've been sharing this work. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what kind of feedback are you getting and how, like, how is this conversation moving forward more broadly within research and policy um, communities? I'm so glad you asked that question because I, I didn't put it in the presentation because I wanted to get through it, but I want to talk very much about this conference we were at. So Tara and I were just yesterday in New Orleans presenting at the American Society on Aging. and. This was an interesting conference because it's not it's mostly not lawyers, it's mostly not academics. It's people from so people from two sides, people from industry. So you have people who run large long-term care groups, you know, you have people from insurance companies. And then on the other side you have what what Tara tells me is pretty new to see at these conferences, which are worker advocates. And the way we presented our, our it was a roundtable, which I also I haven't seen that format in the in the legal and academic uh, conference world. But here we sat around a table with about 15 people who wanted to join our presentation, who are all from these these you know industry or advocacy groups. And we introduced ourselves. We made our presentation, which I actually took 30 minutes, so <laughs> really condensed today. And and then we heard from them. And it was so wonderful because what's happening, and it seems like it's happening in New Mexico, it's happening in California for sure, where they're realizing that there's an important stakeholder, the workers themselves, who are not at the table. And so there's a study going on, a parallel study, which I want to learn more about going on in California right now, not with immigrant women nursing home aides, but with African American women who work as nursing home aides also make up about a quarter of that uh, worker population. And then we also heard from this really interesting program in New Mexico that I might want to try to replicate in Albuquerque. Albuquerque, where they have, they work with home health care aides, so not women in nursing homes, but women who go into people's homes, aging in place, you know, type of thing. And they are trained, they're providing them training, not just on workers' rights and, and their legal rights, but also they're training them on how to do their jobs. Because otherwise, families hire people, they don't know how to provide them with training, like how do you lift a person so you don't get hurt? Or how do you, you know, those kinds of things. How do you medicate, do the medication dispension? So, they're doing that. And then the other really interesting thing they're doing that ties in with other work that I do, cooperative, uh, helping immigrant workers form cooperatives, is that they're helping these women form cooperative business entities. And the importance there is that they then they are no longer employees and they are independent contractors, which gives them a lot more bargaining power and lets them own their own labor. So there are some interesting things on the horizon that I was really happy to hear about and that will inform our work going forward. Thank you. Um, we have time for probably a couple more questions. If you'd like to raise your hand, um, let us know in the chat if you want us to unmute you um, and we'll invite you in to pose your questions. I'm gonna ask another one while we're kind of waiting because I was jotting down a bunch of notes. You mentioned phase three. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, the plans you all have for phase three, particularly as you um, think about sharing this information back with some of the employers, or I think you, you use the term regulators, right? 
Yes, thank you for asking about that too. And this is where we really want ideas from people and we asked at the conference too. So recently we've been, I've been receiving um, interest from the Department of Labor and also the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also under the Federal Department of Labor. They've been reaching out to me saying, look, you have access to this hard to reach population of workers that we would like to protect. Can you tell us what you're hearing? Can you tell us how we can better do our job with respect to this population? So what we are hoping to do in phase three is actually test some of our some of the hypotheses that are coming out of this project like for example if you educate employers and workers together in a space does that help in terms of upholding workers rights moving forward that would be an example of something that we'd love to test and so in order to do that i think we need to be able to work with regulatory and enforcement agencies both on the uh, healthcare side of things, so like Medicaid, the offices for Medicare and Medicaid, but also with um, the Department of Labor and the Employment and Labor Agencies, so that we can work more closely with both employers. We've got the worker population part, we don't have the employer part. And so these are some ideas that we're starting to have because the many of the women we interviewed had great ideas for what might be helpful for them, but now we need to test it, see if it would really work. And so we're open to suggestions on how to go about doing that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Oh, there's Marcelo. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and unmute you really quick so you can pose your question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was trying to type really fast, but this is this is the best I could. Yeah, Shafali, I I I think you and Tara, your role models, and I'm so impressed with what you're doing and. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, because you mentioned really quickly, the sense of, you know, your students uh, hearing the stories, you yourself crying and sort of taking a step back, but even just the people, right, that you were interviewing, how, how do you create an environment where they felt safe to share the stories with you, that they didn't feel re-traumatized by it? And just myself personally, you know, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm new here and I'm so, I'm working with Judy and others and we want to take over the world. But, but myself, you know, I identify, I'm, I'm Latino, I identify with this community. So for me, it's very difficult to really create a healthy boundary between I want to research, I want to extract the data and make some very academically sound <laughs> conclusions. And at the same time, I feel like I'm interviewing my mother or my family members. How do you, how do you, how do you, if, I would love to hear your feedback and if you have any recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you so much, Marcelo. Thank you for being here and for that wonderful question. And I, I don't, I don't think I have the perfect answer, but this is how we do, and we do in the clinical setting with my students. We actually teach about how to identify and then deal with secondhand trauma because we see that with our client population. And many of us come from immigrant backgrounds where there's a re-triggering for us. You know, yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things in terms of with the clients, we do provide them, especially when we know they've been through intense trauma with referrals. Um, there, there are several places where they can go to receive free mental health uh, types of um, help if they if they want it. But what I have found, and this was interesting in the study, that just by coming to us, just by telling their stories, they're working through some of the trauma. Sure, there is some re-traumatization that's happening, but at the end of the day, all, all of them tell us that we're, they're so happy they've been able to let it out. And so there was a real difference between the people we had had as clients in the clinic who had already done this, you know, had already been through this process and how they presented versus people who were coming for the first time. Um, and, and you could see the difference. So I thought that was very interesting and I'd like to talk about that. But in terms of dealing with the trauma later on, I do encourage our clients and the interviewees to, to journal, to go seek some of these resources. And I say the same thing to my students about journaling. It's important to have some space afterwards for yourself so that you can process and think through what you've experienced because it, it's the kind of thing that I thought about for days and days afterwards. Um, so it, that's, you know, that's one way to deal with it. But I would like to make this more a part of what we do in research studies like this and also in the clinic. So if anyone has resources, I'd love to hear about them. Yeah, thank you so much for um, addressing that particular piece, which I know, you know, we, we talk about it in qualitative classes, but to actually get in and, and experience it and, and see and feel um, participants uh, 
narratives in the way that aligns so much with our own families often is is a pretty heavy process. So I appreciate that you all acknowledged it and and our and our sharing resources with it as well. Um, we're going to transition over to Dr. Amanda Chermaya. Shafali, thank you so much for everything. I know you are heading off to class. Please help me um, thank and congratulate um, Shafali and Tara for all of their incredible work. I know this this project will just continue to make such a huge impact, um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, over to you, Dr. Amanda Cheremaya with um, Native SOAR and our next project. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and make sure I have some sound. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's good to connect with all of you. I am, uh, let me see, I'm going to use Google Slides here. Give me a second to uh, pull it up. Um, much love to those that are here right now. Thank you for spending this afternoon with us. Um, all right, so I just want to jump right in. Um, this is our grad here, the Indigenous Communities in the Americas, Learning and Thriving Together Through Higher Education. Um, so uh, Dr. Santiago Castillo, um, he is uh, part of the team. He's a, my co-PI, and so we both work together very closely to help um, in this grant, and Dr. Jenny Lee and Dr. Jamison Lopez, too, are part of our research team. Uh, so I just want to frame this, that history is fluid, that um, I have limited Spanish, uh, and that on this, um, this exchange that we had, and I'll talk, share a little bit more about it, um, and we recently went to Guadalajara, Mexico, which I think that this is a huge part of our grant um, and what we, what I will share about today. But I did travel with my mom, Dr. Rowling J. Ross. She's the one on the left side. Um, I also call her Dr. Mom. And then this is our dear friend, Maho, who is from the university that we connected with. Um, my mom did pay for her own expenses. Um, I do have a visual impairment. And so it's helpful for me to have a guide and a navigator um, and to have a full-sighted person with me. So that is um, a little bit about um, kind of just framing this. Um, so our grant is to connect with ITESO. So ITESO, there's the acronym right there and what it uh, comes out to, but it, ITESO is a university in Guadalajara, Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. So the point and the, the exciting part about this grant is to exchange best practices with our program, Native SOAR, and with ITESO and their community there. Um, the main goal is to learn how our communities um, how in higher education, how we serve our communities. And so we are looking at, um, in terms of the best practices, in terms of the actual looking at the higher education realm. But as we know, our students come from very diverse communities. And in regards to our indigenous people, um, looking at what are some similarities and what are some differences so that the hope is to exchange uh, these best practices so that we can serve and um, build more inclusive communities for our indigenous people here in our country, but beyond and in our um, and our friends in Mexico. Um, so these are some students that were there. We were able to give them some native source swag. Our, our program is designed to engage um, indigenous students from all across educational pathways from kindergarten all the way to the graduate postdoc level. And so we have various initiatives and mentoring um, uh, mentoring programs that help cater to help recruit, retain, and to graduate our Indigenous students here at the University of Arizona. And so we're able to, a big part of that is creating um, marketing material that's culturally appropriate. So we were able to exchange and have this um, interaction with some students from who were some of the Indigenous communities down in the state of uh, Jalisco. And so our, our main connection here is the people um, and the way that they call, they call themselves is Raradica, um, the Raradica people. And they're located about four hours north of uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. And so the community that we went to was Nueva Colonia. So the part, the trip that we um, the big, the trip, the exchange was a huge part of this grant. And so what we did though, is that when we, we went to ITESO and had some exchanges there, learned about their community. And then also we traveled to Nuevo Colonia, which was, yeah, about four hours north of Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, the trip is not for the faint hearted. If you get car sickness, <laughs> that may not be the trip for you because it's just all these switchbacks going back and forth these beautiful majestic mountains and it is a gorgeous drive 
but definitely there's a lot of uh, switchbacks and uh, bumps there. I think we probably going there, I think we probably went over 200 speed bumps. Uh, so we went through a lot of small villages to uh, get to the village that we're, we were going to, and it was uh, located in the mountains. Uh, very beautiful place. If you can just um, imagine Flagstaff and that feel that you have when you um, when your skin touches the air and how you, when you breathe in this fresh air and you just see the blue sky, like that is um, a very similar feel to that you can feel in like in Flagstaff, an area like Flagstaff, um, but how we felt in Nueva Colonia. So I'm gonna describe some themes. Um, and again, remember that history is fluid. And as I describe these things, there's no order of significance, but it's as um, I'm conceptualizing and communicating this with our team, um, as well as our partners at ITESO. Um, and so there are so many more similarities than there are differences. And when we look at the border, a lot of our indigenous people, right, have so many connections across um, inter international boundaries. And so for us, so me and my mom, when we were there, this was um, our accommodation there. Um, and so when we were there, we felt like we were just like at home like we were at grandma's house and even the walls were so thick, like the adobe walls, just like my great grandpa built our, our family house in the village of Pawati and in Laguna. And so even looking at the beams on top, like everything was just so similar to our community um, back on the reservation back in New Mexico. And so as myself, as I'm making connections as a practitioner, I'm making connections myself as an indigenous woman and being there with my mom to navigate these spaces and these spaces that we were welcome to. Um, it's really interesting to note that in the community, we had to get permission to go there um, in the village. And at first they said no, when, when Iteso had asked um, for us to go, but our, our friends at Iteso described that we were from an indigenous community in the States. And once they described more about who we were, they let us go into their community. I think that's really special to note um, when we were there. And I hear some of the pictures um, and the connections that we had. Um, so on the left side is one of our friends in the community. She um, hosted us and gave us, cooked for us. And then on the right, um, again, that was some uh, pictures from the university, but it's these connections that we were making when we were there about, um, you know, who, who, who are the people, right? We come from this place of uh, coming into their community and learning about them. And again, like it was so similar to our communities back home. Um, there were so many cultural shared values. Um, and I'm going back and forth here too between the village as well as the university, but this sense of, 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 of connection and cultural values of, of respect and reciprocity of giving back, of loving our communities, of helping to bridge these pathways from um, these rural urban communities for indigenous communities to the university is so similar. I couldn't believe how similar things were um, to our communities. And so here's a little bit more of observations. Um, in terms of our indigenous students, like um, from here at the university, as well as in Mexico, um, the culture shock is very real um, in terms of how students acclimate to a university setting. ITESO is a private Jesuit university. Um, so it's smaller than the University of Arizona. And I can't recall right now um, how many students, but it's smaller um, in a Jesuit university. And so, but uh, the students though, the way that they matriculate to the university is so similar, where um, indigenous students and the respective populations in both countries, um, how there are challenges getting students to the university to recruit them to um, have, making sure that they're prepared. At ITESO, what's really special is that they have teams that help with that facilitation to get the students connected to ITESO and the resources. They even have staff that provide um, testing and training to help the students test into ITESO and provide that tutoring service, which I think is really powerful because it's their students not even at the university. It's, it's when they're in high school trying to transition to a university setting. So I think that's really neat. Um, again, some of the similarities are the cultural values. Um, the longevity, like our people were built to last, like that is true and true, um, so, so prevalent and that theme of just um, knowing that our people have been here since time immemorial um, is so powerful and, and that is celebrated and that is um, welcomed and just shown in so many capacities at their university as well as at our university. Um, another theme that arose too that, that I didn't anticipate was this theme of violence against women and against 
violent against Indigenous women. Um, so my mom is actually an expert and um, on researching and, and describing and, and doing lectures about missing and murdered Indigenous women. So it was really powerful to be in these spaces with her as our friends um, at ITESO had showed us um, and connected us with different um, partners. And again, that was that theme about um, how our Indigenous um, relatives go missing here and have violence against them in various capacities. That was also another theme that had arose um, within learning about the communities, the Indigenous communities. So I thought that was very striking. And honestly, there's a lot to process with that. But um, so that's one of the themes, that, the similar themes, and then language preservation too. So here in our country, right, English is a dominant language, and in Mexico, Mexico Mexican, the Spanish language is dominant. Um, and so for our indigenous people here, there's always this kind of duality of like, okay, there's our traditional language, and then there's English. And so then in Mexico, with the indigenous people there, it's Spanish and the traditional language. Like, it's really, really interesting to to see like with um, the indigenous students and communities that we learned about how the language is such um, folks struggle too, like um, in terms of the learning Spanish, like they know their lang native language, but then is it like learning the colonizer's language? Is that Spanish, is, should they learn it? Sometimes there's conversations about that. So this whole language preservation too is very powerful, but of course, very uh, much celebrated and of course, very valued within the indigenous communities. Um, some of the differences, the political status for sure is really different. Um, in one of the sessions that I had with the staff at ITESO, um, we talked about their certificate of Indian blood and that was very interesting. For those who may not know, here in the United States, um, for those that are from federally recognized tribes, we have these cards, or it could be a certificate, that it shows how many, how much native blood you have. So it basically like can open up status to give you um, uh, political status and, and uh, membership with tribal communities. So my tribal community has these cards, and it's um, on mine. It says like 31 32nd native blood and 31 32nd Laguna blood. <laughs> it's really quite fascinating. And so I'm 1 32nd French, and it's very interesting like how you break this down into fractions. Um, in Mexico and other places I've been to, like Australia, New Zealand, with the indigenous people, that doesn't happen. Like there's no, there's no fractions. Like, and so that was very interesting conversation in terms of like indigenous identity. Um, I think that's very unique to our country. Um, and so another a, a theme is the circle of life and death. This is so memorable to me. I'm just going to play this video here, but um, this is Carbone. And so Carbone was a little dog that uh, we had met in the village of Nueva Colonia. Hey. And um, Carbone was there. He loved my mom. He would jump up on her leg and you know, uh, greet her every day. Um, and so one day we were out um, doing a couple of things with the community. And we had come back and we had learned that Carbon uh, had got run over. And that was so sad <laughs> to us. And even when I think about it right now, like Carbon was like a part of our, our experience there. And my mom and I like thought about it. We're like, whoa, like Carbon was just here. He went with us in the village and went to like, we were walking around and he joined us. And, and that evening he was gone. And we were just like, wow, the circle of life and death, like it was very impactful for us, you know, like he was a part of the community and to not be there anymore, we were just really touched by that. And so that was that was something my mom and I had talked about often was Carbon. Um, another um, theme, uh, I can watch Carbon all day. <laughs> it was just, uh, just like home. Um, and so I wanna show this video here. Oh my gosh, I don't know if you had lunch yet. I haven't yet, but we had um, uh, friends from the community cook for us every day. And when we sat down, I will tell you, it was just like home. We had the tortillas, we had the chili that was hot, we had the company, we had laughter, we had different languages happening. Like, oh, that was so special. Very, very special, just like home. Um, and then um, built to last. Uh, this is also something too, the jewelry is very, very uh, distinct, the beadwork. Uh, we bought so much jewelry there. <laughs> um, there was even this one story where we walked into the forest and uh, we didn't know that we were supposed to take pesos into the forest <laughs> because there was uh, different folks in the community that would sell and have this beadwork ready to go. And it's amazing because like in the forest community, um, when I say built to last, it's like, 
when you go there, they know how to navigate the land. They know the trails. They know like the seasonal um, changes that happen. And folks like they know the land so well, they would walk around at dark on these trails and know exactly where they're going. And I'm like, I would get lost in these places. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in terms of like, one thing that's powerful to me is that one of our, our um, friends there had told us that they move in their rhythm and their rhythm is very fast, like even just walking. And it just like the endurance of the people there is phenomenal. Like it's just, it's very, very, very powerful. Um, so as I go through here, um, some more themes, connection to the land, of course, that's a huge similarity to indigenous communities um, there in Mexico, as well as here. Um, this is the uh, Mirador, um, the lookout point. Um, this was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Um, and that is like right outside the village um, there that we were able to go and to connect with and to see the sunset. Very, very powerful place. So that kind of just shows you a little bit of what I'm talking about being in the mountains. Um, and as I go forward here, again, I mentioned the language, like that's a, another huge thing. It's funny because my mom and I aren't fluent Spanish speakers. We know very little Spanish, but we did take some Spanish classes throughout our educational career. And it was interesting because by a miracle, there were Spanish words that emerged from us that we didn't even know were in us. <laughs> and so um, honestly, though, like a lot of what we did was we just used Siri. I'm like, Siri, how do you say, can we get the bill? And then we would show like the people at these different establishments, right? And so, so we learned how to navigate. It was really neat and fun to do that. Um, but overall, when we look at this grant here, in terms of recommendations for the University of Arizona, it is so important to expand these partnerships with the universities in Mexico and, and connecting in different ways. Like this, um, this has shown me so much about how our communities are very, very similar. And, I, and I, I'm going to share a little bit more here about what I mean by that. But I believe that we should have a pilot program starting at the University of Arizona's um, College of Education. At ITESO, they have this commission where they have like 10 different people on this team to help the indigenous community there. The indigenous community there is less than 50 students. Here at the University of Arizona, we have 1500 students. And so this commission, I think would be so neat. And, and, and this is a point that my mom really uh, pointed out here is to hire a person dedicated to psychological support. So my mom's a clinical psychologist. And so this was a huge um, point to make because um, this, as we know with our students, when we come to the university, and, and I've been here for since 2004 as an undergrad, but when we come to the university, just that culture shock, right? Like, and how students are, be, are away from home and like away from culture and tradition, and even the cultural religion, like that is very much tied to the land. Um, having that can be very, very, very challenging. And so having this commission within the College of Education, because there are so many students Indigenous students and undergrad and graduate programs, that could be a really awesome place um, to build this commission as a college. I think that could be really, really powerful. Um, also, translating materials um, into Spanish, I think, is very, very important in terms of um, looking at our, our big websites, like, um, and I, ha I haven't had a chance to kind of curate and go through all the content, but um, looking at culturally relevant posters that are in Spanish and with brochures. I know the Office of Early Academic Outreach has done this for many, many, many years. Um, so they have, you know, material in both Spanish and English. And I didn't realize that putting things in Spanish opens up a whole new um, line of communication for our Indigenous community in Mexico. Like, I did not know that until I experienced this trip. And so I think that's so important. Um, also, integrating, um, I'm going to put a little type on there, but um, the, the culture of, of Mexico is very unique, but Latin America um, in regards to indigenous um, realities there, I think is so important. And as well as looking at um, for more opportunities to connect our indigenous wildcats with um, our friends and um, colleagues and communities um, in, in the universities in Mexico. Um, the next steps, so we have a, um, I'm gonna make a 10 minute digital story. Once I make that, I'm gonna make it available to our partners 
um, at the H our H HSI partners. Um, for those who may be interested too on campus, you can just email me. I can also send that too as well. Um, also going to provide high quality photography to our partners as well um, uh, here at the university and in, in Mexico. Um, our friend Adela is coming. She's from Iteso. She um, is going vis to visit us in the first week of May. And we would love, if there's any folks who would love to get connected, um, we would love to um, uh, welcome Della. And so please connect with me and Santiago, because um, we would love, to, for any partners who are listening here today, we would love for you to connect with uh, Della. And then also we're going to have a colloquium to share about our experiences from Iteso, from Iteso's side as well as our side. And then also our goal is to create an article as well and to write an article and just to share about this very unique experience. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I have so many more stories to tell, but uh, I appreciate you for uh, listening to me today. Any questions in these last uh, eight minutes or so? Oh my gosh. So Amanda, like I always, I always love that you are an incredible storyteller. Um, and I have, I have so many things I wrote down, but it looks like Christian, um, I don't know if there's a question or, or if, if it was just a comment. I think it was just a comment. Love these ideas and presentation. Um, if folks have questions, please let us know if you'd like us to unmute you. Um, I'm going to say more about when the your collaborators from Atesso are coming, because that was the question I wrote down was like, yes. when, does, when could that exchange happen? And then are there particular collaborators on campus who you want to be sure have a chance to um, connect with them? Yes. Um, so she is interested in connecting with folks from Latin America studies. Um, and so I know I personally don't have contacts there. Um, Santiago, I know, is um, starting to curate contacts there and uh, have contacts there. So we, um, any honestly, anything in regards to our university culture and working with um, Latinx students is of interest, of course, working with our indigenous communities, Anything in regards to language revitalization too was also very interesting. Um, so honestly, like uh, we're open to any, she's gonna be here for five days, which is a good amount of time. And we're looking to fill those days. So we're so, we're still of course working on the agenda. So anything along those lines, if you wanna share more about your department and how it relates to like uh, reaching out to Latinx communities, anything with the border, like, uh, yes, any any topics like that is of interest. Okay, I wrote down a lot of, uh possibilities because I think even even we when we look back at some of the folks who have presented in this webinar, Sonia Colina, right, her work comes to mind immediately because she oversees the the the, the Center for Interpretation and Translation. And I think you know her work aligns exactly with what you were talking about of making sure that we have more resources in Spanish to reach indigenous populations in Mexico. Um, but yeah, what I um writing stuff down I look look See, look, the teachers, your contacts are here. So yeah, we have Latin American okay. Studies um, and others. Can I take a screenshot or can we get a copy of the chat? <laughs> I will send you a copy of the chat for sure. Um, so are there, are there still additional um, like next steps in terms of either more exchange trips or possible like possibilities for even like, I think about things like, could there be co-teaching of a class? Could there be, um, I don't know, like research partnerships that are developed between um, faculty and staff at both institutions or what, I don't know, what else, what else are you all looking to do? Um, and Martha will uh, unmute you so you can ask your question as well. Yeah, you know, the next steps um, were kind of what I mentioned on the slide there. We haven't really thought about beyond, co-teaching is a really interesting concept. We did before I went to the exchange, we had um, an exchange, well, we had a Zoom meeting with our Indigenous students and their Indigenous students. Um, it was, you know, you can only do so much on Zoom and and we all, it, it, it was hard, it's difficult, like, um, but, you know, that that might be something to consider. Santiago, I know you're online here as we go forward. Co-teaching would be something very interesting, but I want to hear the question from yeah. Martha says, yeah. Hi. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for an awesome presentation. I love Guadalajara and, and it's nice to see pictures of uh, uh, land that I love. Um, I also love the idea of the commission that your mom also thought of and, and expanding that collaboration between UA and other Mexican higher ed institutions. I wonder if, if something similar has been done with the state of Sonora. 
I always think of the neighboring state as a good beginning for collaborative work, maybe with the University uh, of Sonora, Unison, uh, which is located in Hermosillo. And I know there's a lot of indigenous um, uh, communities around Hermosillo. So that's something that I think also can be very beneficial, but I don't know if it already exists. Oh, that's powerful. I, I don't know of anything that exists right now. And as you were talking, Martha, I was also thinking like a commission for our Latinx students here too. I don't know if that exists either, honestly. I'm still learning a lot about, you know, what HSI means and what that looks like on our campus, but I that could be such a powerful connection. Um, Santiago, I'm taking notes. <laughs> so <laughs> this is something to talk about with our partners. I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. You know, Martha, um, directly kind of aligned with your your question, there's been some initial kind of possibilities and uh, conversations that, that Jenny Lee, um, that Nadia Mejia, um, and um, Ileana Reyes have, have mm -hmm. started um, with some of the partners in Mexico that you mentioned in Sonora. So there are some initial conversations happening. Um, exactly kind of along the lines that you noted and um, they would be the best ones to talk to about it and I but I think you know Amanda related to this project I think there's like some great parallels for sure and so so much right so many ideas and so many things people are putting a ton of different resources and folks to connect with in the chat so I will be sure that this all gets to you afterwards awesome this was fantastic thank you so much for the ideas, for the passion, for the energy, for the storytelling, for the beautiful photos and videos. Um, I was I was drawn to the dog too because oh, I always tell people well, I grew up on a ranch and that is how we learned about life and death was through our animals and it's a very natural part of teaching about the life cycle. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you for for bringing home knowledge um, into this space too. So. Thank you for everything. Oh, Santiago um, just shared a little bit more um, about the Mexican Undersecretary of Higher Education. Yes, so that was part of the conversations that I mentioned and the possibilities of a similar project um, with, with Indigenous universities in Mexico. So there, like as I mentioned, there's conversations happening. We'll keep folks um, updated, I'm sure, as your project grows as well. Uh, we have to end our webinar series for the year. I wish we didn't, but we'll be back in the fall, um, potentially with um, you know expansions of these very topics. And if you have ideas of folks or projects that you would like to hear about um, or learn more about, please send them our way um, because we're always looking for incredible um, faculty, staff projects to highlight and spotlight during these webinar series. So. Um, I will be sure also to be back in touch with everybody who has registered so that you have all of the links for the entire series um, for the year and we'll um, share resources as well when we share those out. So thank you everybody for being here. Amanda, thank you for thank you. representing um, your team and the project. Um, and of course, big thanks to Shivali and to, to Tara as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next year. Bye.